So, so thank you so much, doctor, for staying with us because this was a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. Uh, it looks so complicated, but <clears throat> you made it understandable to chemists. So thank you so much. Um, I wonder if someone wants to start off. Uh, Mary, you raised your hand. Why don't you tell, uh, ask your question? I did. Um, thank you, Dr. McLean. I wonder if you might comment on how rapidly and effectively the, uh, I call them the UMAB uh, drugs, the, um, <clears throat> the cancer treatment drugs have been and how rapidly they're evolving. Well, so that's a really good question. Um, and I, I do need to preface this by, um, while I work with a lot of cancer biologists, I am not a cancer biologist myself. And, and so it kind of goes back to sort of the, the team sort of aspect. But as, as sort of an educated observer of, um, of the field, I think there are a couple of cancers that were really close. Uh, and you can sort of see this over, over time as well. Things like breast cancer and prostate cancer, we've made enormous inroads. Um, the one where we're making a lot of inroads right now is a little more general. Um, and it's uh, related to toll-like receptors. Um, and so there are some cancers like small lung carcinoma uh, and others where if you have a certain genetic profile that can be um, discerned really pretty quickly, uh, the, the outcomes for those are, are really, they're getting better and better all the time. Um, so the, the particular drugs that you commented on, I'm not sure that that it would be appropriate for me to sort of comment on those. But, but I do think in cancer, there are a number of um, real advances that people are making. I have to say though, cancer has been one of those things which is, uh, it's, it's been so recalcitrant, like it is so complex, right? That where like, I think Nixon had the first, um, you know, we're, we're gonna fight a war on cancer. And what we found after a number of years is uh, it's just too, you know, there's too much going on here. But I think now that we understand a little bit better for specific cancers, it's getting better. Thank you. I had a question about the vaccines for COVID. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, well, it didn't take long enough to, uh, develop these and are they safe and so forth? And uh, does um, the science you talked about, has that helped in the development of these new COVID drugs? And, um, you know, should it help in the, f I, I assume it will help in the future when we're trying to make other vaccines. That's a really great question, Kathy. And, and in fact, uh, we've been, in, we've, been heavily involved in different aspects of this. So we also collaborate very closely with Pfizer. Um, and so we've been working on uh, understanding some of the adjuvants in different, different ways, right? Not necessarily for COVID, but for um, vaccines in general. And to kind of unpack a little bit of what you'd described too. I, working with a lot of the clinical faculty and things, I, I have to, a lot, of, a lot of vaccine work was done at Vanderbilt. And Barney Frank, who was credited at the NIH, you know, trained at Vanderbilt and so forth. So all of the efforts that went into the testing went through the exact same efforts that any vaccine would go through. It's just, it went faster. And faster does not mean that any compromises were made. It was just more resources were devoted because this was, this was a global emergency. Um, and so, in fact, one of the, the gentlemen here um, was instrumental in, in a lot of the, the Moderna uh, vaccine too. And 
some of the treatment strategies like the drugs that are being developed around Corona right now. There's a lot of work at Vanderbilt too. So he had studied coronaviruses since the 1980s. And what's really interesting is, is he said, you know, every year I talk to my wife because I'm not sure if people are going to fund this anymore. And then all of a sudden he, he was with his wife at dinner and he gets a call like, uh, we'd like to chat with you because there's some things coming out of China we'd like to understand a little better, right? And all of a sudden it became really, really important. And so that fundamental aspect of science, I think, is key. Um, from just that story, right? They, were, they, they really didn't know that Corona was going to be the one that jumped or anything. I think a lot of the vaccine hesitancy, though, does center around what you sort of describe as the speed, because this is so unprecedented how quickly things went. I also think there's a lot of hesitancy because it's under the so-called uh, emergency youth off use authorization, right? And that's because our processes aren't really set up that when we do have an emergency like this, that you know it will get regular approval or anything. But I but I think they need to do that just so that people feel more have more confidence that everything has been done. Um, and I, I don't want us to get lost, you know, in the semantics of what's emergency use versus regular proof. Nobody cares. They want to know, like, is this is this safe for me, my family, and my friends? And uh, so I think that's where some of the I'm, I think I'm just sort of going rambling at this point. But but you you brought up some really interesting ideas that I know a lot of us have thought about. But I think there, there are a lot of um, ways that we're using these technologies for, um, for coronavirus and for others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from our, uh, our group? Well, if, if, if I could ask a question too. So uh, sort of, a lot of the students that that um, we have, you know, are first year students. I'm I'm just kind of curious about where all of you sort of view the most important areas of chemistry and sort of education for preparing those students for the next steps of their kind of scientific journey. Like, where are the struggles and the, the, the pinch points that you're you're observing? I can speak for my, I, I teach um, lab, uh, freshman labs at Rhode Island College. Um, and uh, I find that my students, even though we've made reforms um, in high schools and all this talk about, and all the chemistry teachers I know are just exemplary, that the students come often very unprepared to think. Um, and their math skills are uh, terrible. Um, and their, their, their ability to analyze is not developed. Um, and I keep thinking that's, that's a societal issue in so many ways uh, in that it's not something that people aspire to anymore, you know, because things are so instant that they don't have to think a lot. So that those, those, everything is meshed together, you know, and, and uh, even though kids seem to do well in algebra in high school, they don't bring that with them into my class all the time. So it's kind of interesting. I don't know about how other people feel. So. Katie, I totally agree with you. And my apologies for being off camera. I was listening intently, but making coffee at the don't same apologize. time. apologize. <laughs> no. Um, I totally agree with you. I think there's that, there seems to be this uh, level of compartmentalization in education. Yes, yes. That students can't take a concept. They may be le learning high conceptual levels in one subject and they just can't transfer to the other. And trying to make those connections really difficult. And even though we could be teaching them one year after the next and you bring, you do the metacognition to get them to okay. remember when we did that lab, remember when we spoke of, it goes, 
it's it's a very short time frame of memory and just um, a block to make connections. Mm. Can we get some more responses to that? Um. Kathy, um, you and I have spoken at length, but um, we know that, and what Elizabeth just alluded to, that if mathematics at every level is taught just as mathematics, uh -huh. they, they stop in their tracks at chemistry. And if it's not integrated, and if it's not done sequentially <clears throat> and used, then the problems exist. And they become, we, we, we lose a lot of really able students um, because they get discouraged. Hmm. So it has to be integrated rather than taught just as individual in a bubble. Um, and I'm not, I'm not blaming teachers of math, but it has to be integrated. I agree, Mary. I remember, um, uh, so I'd say, I'd say probably a decade ago, there was a colleague of mine in the math department and she was teaching logarithms and she would use the calculator to explain the theoretical concept of logarithms. And I would do the old fashioned way, using the tables for tangible mathematical pattern development and then apply it to uh, pH labs. And students I felt then really came away and we were able to do that because the mathematical and the scientific, we made the two curricula line up side by side. So every April, that this is it. This is our topic. This is the connection. This is the crossover, doctor, as you referred to the connections. And, um, but with then came a, a, a new outline of the math curriculum to support the SATs. And we lost that time connection and that colleague retired and the, you know that connection just lost and I thought that's what we need to do more and more and more of. And, and that goes um, a lot of my students are bio majors um, and that's the other thing they'd much rather study biology and uh, you know, when I was going to school, nobody made me study biology, which I'm really sad about at this point in time. I, and, and yet uh, the chemistry is the first thing that they should be, they should be under beginning to deal with. And so to mix these two together, to bring more biology, that's uh, more biology into the chemistry. Uh, we do that for our uh, nursing students, but we don't do it for our, our chemistry students. And um, sometimes I wonder how they decide what to study as they go beyond that. Of course, I don't know what they're teaching in some of the bio courses. So, um, but I would wish for more on the college level, at least more integration of all of those things. And it seems like we are compartmentalizing still like we did in the whole factories rather than uh, beginning to to bring all these pieces together um and and it's i don't know what it's going to take to make colleges teach differently i i really don't and doctor i very much appreciate your use of the central science be that of chemistry yeah. <laughs> when you mentioned that but actually I, may i ask you a question dr mclean um you know, you mentioned about the connections that um, your students have with industries around about to build the skills so that that partnership exists. And we, I teach high school, and we've spoken of that and had some of those connections and some of our alumni come back and, and um, build a more broader perspective to our students thinking or trying to see what is out there. But from the perspective of a high school student, what skills would you like a really solid chemistry student to come into college with? 
if you were to bring it down to a few really solid skills. And I would say that I would probably, um, I'm in the latter years of my teaching, but I would have had a very classical education behind me. And I bring that more to my classroom. So I try to cover all the primary topics and primary skill sets that I would want my students to have. But what do you think we should bring, we should develop in our students for you to take them to that next level? Boy, that's a really great question. Um, <clears throat> let me share a couple of really disjointed observations, and then I'll, I'll try to answer your question more directly. Oh, sure. So we have noticed that, um, uh, well, it's not just us, but you know, nationally, there are a lot of disparities in sort of the educational preparation. And Vanderbilt um, sort of has a reputation as being a little elitist. But in fact, many of our students are first gen students. Um, and, and we also don't, don't discriminate based on financial means at all. In fact, we still have one of the pro we're one of the only universities now where students will not leave with debt. And so sort of against that context, some of the, it's difficult for us to evaluate um, student preparation because they're coming from a lot of schools where maybe um, the number of students that matriculate at colleges aren't very high, right? And so one is a difficulty on our part to be able to evaluate. A second is um, sort of a lesser reliance on standardized testing. And some of that is also motivated because of difficulty for students to have access. And that's at kind of at all levels. Um, and maybe not for our undergraduates, but like right now we're having a lot of difficulties with international students entering our graduate programs because they can't take a GRE. And so most chemistry programs have all suspended their standardized testing requirements. So where we're finding the best resonance in that way is what are those, what are the research experiences that the students have had? And so the number one thing I would answer your question most directly is what are the practical things that they've done? And it's a little more amorphous and you're going to see a lot of differences, right? But um, what is, and during, after the, in the Q&A, there were, there was sort of like this, should students have a lot of lab practice? The more they have of that is, the, in fact, the best, that is the best predictor we have of their preparation. What we have done internally to kind of try to stem some of the, the issues that we've seen about mathematics preparation and so forth, is we have a lot of pilot projects going on now at a university level where we have boot camps and trying to, before the semester begins their first year, um, trying to figure out, can we capture some of those students that maybe we should give them uh, like three weeks of uh, mathematics preparation that they are going to use in their first year in the different like physics and chemistry classes that they might encounter. Um, and it's still, the verdict is still kind of out right now, but what we're trying to do internally is also make sure that those students that participate in those programs remain in the same cohorts. Like, like when they take um, general chemistry or general physics, that they remain in the same uh, sections, right? Because they're developing those relationships with the other students. They've all gone through sort of this uh, remedial, if you will, sort of prep preparation for, for their college courses. But everything that I've heard from all of you about like math preparation and things like that, I mean, we see it too. And, and I mean, that's a natural consequence, right? And so how do we, but having said that, also working with our colleagues in the math department um, and trying to break down and integrate like 
what they're teaching. Because almost all of our students are required to take calculus. And, um, and the students don't like it. Many of the, the people teaching it don't like to teach it. <laughs> it's like, you know. And, and I'm, I don't mean that to sound like an aspersion, right? But um, trying to, if our colleagues in other fields are also sort of doing that integration piece, I think that's also important. Um, we don't know what the, what the silver bullet is. But, but back to your question of what could you do sort of in preparation, the number one thing are those lab experiences and getting them engaged in things like uh, uh, science fairs, invention fairs. I mean, it's sort of the, the practical knowledge that I think students are able to conceptualize sort of the big picture a little better. It's kind of like that. And I remember when I took calculus as a senior in high school, I remember distinctly thinking to myself, when am I ever gonna use the, and you know, and now I'm telling like my fifth grader, I use calculus every day. When I'm washing the dishes and I am looking at the rate of water coming in, I am using calculus. And they get a little tired of it, but um, my daughter, you know, she'll let me get away with it a little bit. But um, but I think it's really the how do you how do you bring the pieces together? And I think we all struggle with that. Right? No, thank you so much, because sometimes I think that um, there's that, that those core labs that we've, we do, we build upon, we uh, extrapolate from, we get them thinking, we give them um, more analytical questions and synthesis questions to get them thinking what's really going on. And then you know, a lot of the research says we should be also doing more project work. And so, and frankly, it's that balance of time and to ensure we're giving them the strong skill set and yet bringing them to that next level. It's that balance of time, of course. So we always um, challenge ourselves with balancing time. Yeah, that's right. So thank you. You know, it's it's very interesting what um, how the sequence of teaching science courses is at at uh, in schools in high school. It's it was always that <laughs> that ABC thing. As our professor uh, fifty years ago, which was teaching us about that. You know, oh, they had a committee of. 12 or whatever it was and and they decided it should be alphabetical and darn it it's still alphabetical even though various kinds of programs i i was involved in some training things for teachers who were going to have chemistry first and then there was physics first and it all seems to have dissipated um you know things come in and out of out of favor, it appears, but I always go back to that old traditional way of putting physics last. So a lot of kids never see how uh, the math or anything relates to that. Uh, and that's very frustrating. Um, that's a really good point. I had never made that connection before, but Kathy, you were spot on. And in fact, I think like if physics were sort of their introduction, you know, biology might be you know, that sort of engages them, right? Because that's sort of the world around them. But then physics is, and chemistry, I think, has been as challenging for some students because oh. it's a little more, esoteric is not the right word. It's a little more difficult for them to see, right? Because uh -huh. I remember the, the first time I saw a picture of an electron, like the, <laughs> the IBM thing, like where they, they actually show the wave function. I was like, holy crap, everything they told me was true. Well, <laughs> that's awesome. But, it, but, but there is kind of this leap of faith because, you know, let's face it, chemistry is the original nanotechnology, right? So you just, it's very difficult to, to, to visualize. But if you had physics before it, I think the math would help a lot to understand what was happening. 
I think too, they all require a very strong underpinning of a physical science background. Yeah. So that if students at the younger ages just have a dinosaur project, and I'm not disparaging those, but a dinosaur project or a, an autumn uh, leaves and apples project, et cetera, if they do not have a strong basis in the physical and a really good physical science program, then, then they they hit a they hit a wall with physics or chemistry. Then you can do such really neat stuff with physical science. Whoops. True, true. I I must say I come from. I was lucky in that I grew up in Ireland and my high school education, the first three years was an integrated biology, chemistry, physics yes, yes. that paralleled the math program. So yes. what we were learning in math was, and they became just science. It was, it was science and it was probably the best foundation that I could ever impart to a student it would be that that breaking down the barrier between biology chemistry and physics and have them all blend together um, and i wish yeah i wish we could do that more so i suppose that's what i would love to develop more yeah we um i have um a friend who um <clears throat> their company sent them to um ireland to uh, work uh, for a number of years and her child came back. He was now in probably fourth grade and she felt he was, he was way more prepared than any of the kids in his fifth grade class or fourth grade class. And, and that whole European model makes so much sense in that they, they just distribute everything together. So you're not learning one discipline at a time. You're learning everything together as it fits. And I don't know why we're ne we were never able to, you know, to do that except tradition. Tradition seems, you know, uh, culture culture is is um, is made is is established so it resists change, and that's the that's the sad thing about it. Uh, the good thing about it is that it resists change. So uh, I mean, you know, it's funny. I taught in a situation where we were trying to change the way we taught in high school. Uh, when I was uh, when I was in teaching in high school, and uh, some of that is actually stuck and has been uh, integrated in so many different ways. But um, but it's interesting how culture you know can do that. And yeah, uh, what about the people who haven't spoken? Say say a few words. Okay, I'll say a few words. Okay. I think we're our elementary education is in fact traveling in the opposite direction for what we have recommended. There's so much emphasis on reading and math nowadays that in many schools there is no hands-on science that okay. students will will. They, one of the reading requirements is that they read nonfiction. So they have them read science. And my daughter had a very good analogy. She said, why don't we have the kids read exercise books instead of doing physical education? And that's pretty what's, much what's happening in elementary school. They read about science, but they don't do science. So do you, th do you see any reason why that might be happening? Uh, I think it has to do with the standardized testing. Yeah. The emphasis on that has uh, has driven out a lot of things that we used to do and which work very fairly well. At least there used to be <clears throat> a fair number of elementary teachers who liked science and were interested mm -hmm. in science. And it was pretty much luck whether you got one of those or didn't. Mm -hmm. But the people mm -hmm. who had them learned a lot of things. Uh, the other thing is we're, we've been talking about um, the way they can't apply knowledge for learned in one subject to another subject. Mm. A lot of this has to do with their immaturity. And, mm. and frankly, this is something that teachers can't solve because there are, uh, there are a lot of forces in today's society that do not encourage students 
or children in general to take responsibility and become more mature. Mm. Well, we're babying them. You know, the, the, the one thing that kind of strikes me as well, I really appreciate your comments, Betty. <clears throat> we also see a lot of students, once they get to the college level where they're not free to explore or they feel like they are not free to explore. Maybe it's because they're being over, overly parented or what have you, but, and I kind of refer to it as a fear of failure. And like when, when I was an undergraduate, it took me close to six years to get my bachelor's degree. Um, I have more credits than anybody should ever have because I was like a, I really wanted to be an economist and a political scientist. And I didn't take my first Gen Chem class till spring semester of my junior year. And I felt comfortable enough to be able to, to say, you know, yeah, this isn't really my thing. But even like, like my elementary middle school children almost feel like they're being asked to choose what is their career going to be. Mm-hmm. And I don't want them to do that. I. <clears throat> And, and I also, like in my mom's middle school, you know, and I went to my mother's middle school, which is a whole different story. It was great, but especially when I forgot my lunch money. Um, you know, I had wood shop and I had metal shop and I had these other, um, you know, sort of arts. And honestly, the skills that I learned in there, I use in my work every day. And whether it's engineering on how to conceptualize, like if I build this birdhouse this way, it's going to work. If I, you know, go this other way, it's not. And I really feel like sort of that hands-on again, right, is really key to be able to understand the connections and the crossovers. And Betty, I totally agree. If it's all math and it's all English, we're in a lot of trouble because you know, I, I see this funneling down where students don't have these broader experiences that they can draw upon that are just very practical in nature. And I think having Siri around is a real issue. And, and what I mean is like, you know, gone are the days where like you could have a conversation, a free flowing conversation about factual things. Because today people just, you know, don't know what is quote unquote the internet says true in a matter of seconds. And so there's such a heavy reliance on having that information that there's less of a, uh, like, you know, an ability to be able to pull out an atlas and like look up where our, you know, just simple things. Something else that occurs to me is something you were talking about before, if you wouldn't feel comfortable taking apart your iPhone and putting it back together. And this this goes across everything in life. I mean, ancestors who grew up on a farm learned how to fix things. That's exactly. Now we don't fix things, we throw them away and we buy a new one because if we try to fix them, we're likely to electrocute ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, I want to say something uh, to Betty and to Dr. McLean. Um, this, I'll be starting 33 years teaching in the public school in high school in the town that I had grown up in. And I'm teaching at the high school that I graduated from. Uh, but prior to the 13 years I've been there, I was at another high school in, this, in the same large district. And With regard to the elementary schools, I decided that I was going to use some of my students or I not use them, but I introduced them to going and becoming the teacher. And uh, there were certain labs that I had prepared for first grade, certain ones for second grade, certain ones for third grade. And I broke them all up and they practiced and they got to know and We also brought um, their goggles and their lab coats and whatever. And of course we were able to get a, um, you know, a bus to go to the outlying uh, towns. 
and or even just within the same city because we're in the largest city in, in New Hampshire. So everyone, I did that for about 10 years. And then of course, um, you know, all the different things about, well, you have to make sure you have a nurse on board and you have to do this and you have to do that and all of these regulations. And uh, the students that I met on first grade, by the time I got them, they were in their junior year and they remembered my students going. And, but I've tried to get that same program going again and I just hit a wall each time. And that's where, and then I have a, a program where I work with students that have gone through my general chem class and they wanted to do a little extra. So I convinced the, um, extended learning opportunities coordinator to give them an extra credit so they could become my lab assistant and they would help to do stuff and they some of them are now uh, had gone on to their um, their PhDs and some are nurses some are doctors and whatever so I I think back at all the wonderful I felt the wonderful things that I could do but in today's society, as many people have said, it's that immediate um, need the students want. And they're, they're afraid or petrified of math because of some opportunity early in their life that they didn't feel success. And I try to bring the simplest thing. And, and like you say, integrate the biology and the physics and the, the chemistry in my classes and my colleagues, they just go by chapter to chapter to chapter, not me. I, I don't like to lecture. I like to engage and I like to get them and they are always in great, you know, enjoying. And this past year was hell. So I, I don't know uh, how I could even develop what I used to do and bring it into today's society, but I know it was a success and I wish I, if I had any, if anybody could give me any ideas of how I could do that again, you know, maybe I could end my career in the next two to three years because I can't afford to retire. <laughs> so, um, you know, give me some ideas. But, in, and I wanted to thank you again, Dr. McLean, that it was um, so interesting and just to listen to see how everything is going in, um, in on the college level and in the research, it's, uh, it provides me some encouragement that there are good things happening. It's not always bad. Well, we're pro profoundly grateful to what all of you are doing, right? And, and, you know, it is a community. And what I think is really cool about this, this group too is, right, like there are people both separated by geography and at different levels and you know, it really is a community that's doing this. I, what you described is exactly what I think people should be doing. And it kind of breaks my heart to hear that you run into regulatory things that sound, you know, if, if I was in your class, I would love it, right? Because I was able to stick my hands into stuff, really be able to do it. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Dr. McLean about science fairs. Um, <clears throat> I'm involved in our local science fair in Rhode Island. We're a small state, so we have one we have one big science fair at the end after all the schools finish. And uh, some of the kids do some amazing stuff, but but the numbers have been uh, getting smaller and smaller over the, over the past few years. Um, one reason I think is because teachers have so many things that they have to do based on various regulations that um, it, instead of, I'm one of those people, I like to be out of the box. I don't want you to tell me what to teach on what day, etc. But unfortunately, that seems rampant. And it takes away the creativity and the, the will that some of the teachers have to give a little bit extra. 
to help some of their brighter kids. Um, so, uh, you know, do you have any ideas how we could promote science fair um, other than being an obligatory thing that is like, oh no, science fair, I got to do a project. It should be a fun thing. No, I totally agree. I, I don't have any good answers for that, but I will tell you like, um, I have high school students reach out to me, um, I'd say maybe one a month and all around the country. And I meet with each and every single one of them. And, um, but these are the, these are the, these are the kinds of students that they are just fearless and sharp. They know what they want to do. I think if there are ways that we can build partnerships, um, a, a sort of, you know, a, in primary school, but also with colleges, that would be great. Um, I had one one student who was a high school student do a science fair project in my lab, and uh, and he never told me. I was so angry, but he got to meet President Obama because he got third place in like the. And, and I'm like, was that pretty cool? And he's like, oh, it's amazing. And so like just, and I know that Adam is gonna go on and do these wonderful things, but how do we get all, how do we get all of the students that want to have those experiences do them, right? And I think also, so building relationships in that way, like telling students like, do some research on the internet find a college or a university where someone's doing that, something you're interested in and reach out. I think between companies and schools, like building those relationships. So I know Kristen had mentioned that her husband works at one of the companies that we work with quite a bit. And that company in particular, uh, for many years would build these little kits that they would send to schools. Um, to do chromatography, like in cartridges. So what they would do is they would, and I've used them for my kids' birthday parties, right? So it's like they, they'll give you a, a Kool-Aid packet and they teach you chromatography by taking purple Kool-Aid and separating out the different colors by the different molecules into different beakers. And the kids, lo uh, they love it. And it's so cool to do. But I think if there are ways to engage public-private partnerships. Uh, and I don't know how to, you know, there, there are people that have thought through that a lot more than I have, but, but I do know a lot of companies would like to do that, but how do you do the matchmaking, right? Is, uh, because the, the companies really want to engage the students as early as they can too. Um, but, and some of them just don't know how. And so I, I don't know if that's helpful or not. But. We have found that a lot of, um, we have a particular family that has uh, two or three kids that have really done amazing work because the father is a doctor and there is, um, you know, it's a, it's a family connection, even though the schools they go to seem amenable to do that. We also have had people whose schools would not sponsor them or what weren't doing it, but they, they managed to come anyway um, as, a, as a lone person um, and did very well as well. So uh, it, it's an uphill battle. In general, people, you know, if you tell someone you're a chemistry teacher, they usually look at you in disbelief and like, why would you ever want to do that? That's horrible, you know, which is the attitude, you know, even, even in the scouts. I mean, I wonder how much science the scouts do. Um, you know, anyway, so it's, it's um, I don't know. Science just uh, seems to turn some people off, unfortunately. And we, I had a student say to me once, you know, do you guys talk about science at home? I said, yeah. She said, oh, it must be really boring. My husband's an engineer and we do a lot of talk about science. We love to do things like that. But, um, you know, just to mainstream a little bit of this would be, would be so nice instead of having people resist it for some reason. Um, Anyway, we keep trying. 
So does anybody else go, go ahead? Well, I was just going to say, I think one, one way to help too is honestly, it's groups like this. And that is bringing together sort of like-minded individuals in different places, right? And that's how you, networking is how you form connections. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a lot of work. And uh, sometimes it really pays off, but you can never predict where, where it's going to really, people are going to resonate or make connections in different ways. <clears throat> I, I did not, I was unaware of this group until a few months ago, and uh, I think it's really cool. Um, so I, you know, yeah, I think being able to foster relationships like this, I think, is one of those ways. It's messy, and it takes time, and... <laughs> Do we have any other questions or observations? We have plenty of time. Yeah, maybe just one observation, yeah. and I'll apologize. I have to leave that. Um, it's interesting, you know, Canvas, uh, we want our students to experiment, and experiment is like, uh, Dr. Wynn, you mentioned in your lecture about um, a colleague in Virginia whose child was outside, eighth grader, yep. And we want them to just to go out and enjoy and experiment and, and investigate what's all around about them. And yet, and Judith, you were saying, the constraints within schools, you're in boxes, you have to have the nurse, you have to have this, you have to test for their allergies. That society is boxing us in more so, and we want them to go out and experiment even more. So there's this, this push me, pull you that seems to be constantly in motion. And maybe that's the stressor on society we need. How do we overcome it? I don't know, but we'll keep at it. <laughs> Kathy, Kathy the, and everyone, there's, I think I'm, I lean toward Dr. McLean uh, in terms of optimism. And that is, we can each make a difference. Now I'm retired for three years, but no, almost four now. Yeah, it's 2021, four years. But my second grandchild who's about to enter sophomore year texted me yesterday and he told me who was chemistry teacher after his hockey game I said to him I knew the answer that if he was taking chemistry this year his older brother had and their chemistry teacher happens to be a NEACT member and she was uh, she's been at conferences and so he texted me yesterday who we had, and then attached to that text was, take a look at this video. So it was that he got on Twitter. So I had to go, I have Twitter, but I never use Twitter. I go on Twitter and it's, a, <clears throat> it's an iron filings Zen garden. And he was fascinated by it because it shows the magnetic fields and throwing the iron filings up to a, to a magnet that's suspended and all of this. And I watched it, but I wrote back to him and asked, I said, I think, didn't you guys have um, the Etch-a-Sketch uh, when you were little kids? I said, it's, you know, the same principles. And he wrote back to me and he said, it's really cool to really see the magnetic field. You know, then I wrote back to him and said, you know, when you, once you're taking chemistry, it's a, it's a really cool idea for passwords to use one of the elements names, lo, a long element name, and throw a number in the middle of it. Like, and I gave him a, I gave him an example. It's not my password, by the way, but uh, but it's like potassium, and and where the I is, you throw a one or a two or a five or your favorite or your hockey number or whatever in it. And he wrote back, "Oh, that's pretty cool." And and those little things of interactions with whatever our purview is, whatever circle we can influence is, is great. I just, I just feel so, so sad that there isn't 
a lot of laboratory work, actual lab lab work done, and um, it is changing, and much can be virtual. My last year of teaching in community college was was absolutely wonderful, and and some of the programs are, are beautiful. You can it's wonderful to see a reaction take place instantaneously. It's also wonderful to see it microscopically as the crystals form from who's done that, who's done that work that you can't do in your own lab and have students take it from there. There really are some wonderful avenues, but I think it all really comes down to the teacher-student interaction too. Um, Mary, I agree. I mean, <clears throat> we're not, I don't think anyone here is discouraged. I think we're all just keep working. You know that, you know, we all, we're all keep, keep going. And, and it's like, you know, I'm excited about doing it. And therefore that excites some people. You never know who you're going to be, who's going to make it an impression on you. I was, when I was teaching in, uh, when I first started teaching in high school, somebody, um, Somebody asked, they asked me a question, they asked one of the teachers a question. And I remember her, her saying that something like, oh, you need some elbow grease to go do that. And so, and so the girl came to me and she said, do you have any elbow grease? You know, <laughs> it was like, and you know, I met her later in life and she remembered that for some reason, it was just really cool. You know, just, just plain old practical stuff. And that's, we have to be models. I, I feel we're mentors and models, and that's what we're always going to be. And if we just keep doing that, we can make a little difference in the world and maybe a little ripple, you know, it's like we're, uh, we, you know, we're some kind of advocates all the time. You know, that's what we do. We just keep pushing certain things. I have a question for Dr. McLean. Um, it's about how did, how did students learn about things such as we were discussing, the phenomics, um, you know, because that's a fairly new area. And how do, how do students, you know, begin to begin to say, I want to do that. That's just so new. I never heard of it before kind of thing. And, and you know, how, how does that happen? Because the kids I had in chemistry don't have a clue about any of that, I'm sure. Boy, Kathy, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> um, you know, and <clears throat> I, the other thing based, you know, to kind of dovetail with uh, your comments and Mary's comments too, is like one of my wife is a forensic psychologist. Oh, and so wow. she, she um, goes to prisons and jails and does competencies, you know, and so she sees sort of the dark, <laughs> but one thing that we both really have always appreciated, and I'm sure everyone on this call does it doesn't matter what somebody does, like what their profession is. They could be like um, a park ranger or, you know, they could clean the, the waste bins at the park or something. But as long as they enjoy what they're doing and they're passionate, then God love them, right? And so like just remaining kind of happy about what you do, I think is, is at least for me, half the battle. Um, getting students sort of engaged in, in understanding some of these topics. I, I think asking the students where they learn, like, what do they do? Like, Mary was mentioning the video with the iron filings, right? And so, like, my 10 and 11-year-old um, love pulling up science videos from YouTube. And there are like these interesting, for lack of a, and I'm kind of using terms that I really is way beyond my, my knowledge base, but there are these like science influencers oh. <laughs> on, on the internet. Um, and I think it's really trying to meet people where they are, right? And that is a lot of a lot of kids today are they don't watch television, they don't do they they watch short 
videos that are created by people. And like there's this one guy, I think his name is Matt Roper. Uh, I may be getting his name a little wrong, but he used to work at NASA and then like at Google or something. And he makes these videos, but they have a lot of science in them that are really engaging, like um, this obstacle course for these squirrels that kept invading his yard. And I know it sounds really silly, right? But, but when you think of how all of the science that went into all of these things, and it's a lot of that practical knowledge, like, you know, hey kids, go outside and play. And they're learning about those things from these videos. Now, once you start getting to some of the things like omics, right? It starts getting a little more esoteric again. And um, I don't know, there, there are people like Bill Nye that I still love to death, right? But, you know, it's just um, trying to figure out how to meet people where they are. And some, and if they're in grade school and things, they, they can get their mind around certain concepts, but they haven't been introduced to others, right? I think for students that might be in high school, they're already into searching stuff and kind of getting, they're finding avenues to get that kind of information. Um, but I think it's mostly through like communication and you know, being able to communicate our science is, I always think of science as being like sort of three pillars, like where we're doing research, right? One are you have like sort of funding agencies, you have academics, but the third leg of that stool is our science writers and uh, people that can communicate sort of what's on the fringe of our knowledge is just such a skill. Um, so like at our university, we just recently started a program in science communication. Uh, and I'm really glad that we, we have, um, you know, these are really sharp students, but what they're, they're figuring out is there was a point in my talk too, where I, I was about to use a word and I stopped myself uh, and used a different word specifically because that's a whole different science and how to talk, right? And like, I was gonna use like uh, drug efficacy. I'm like, no, that's not the right word to use right now, right? And so it was like uh, how, how effective a drug would be. And so it's kind of like, how do you demystify stuff by trying to get the jargon out? Because it, it really doesn't belong there in the first place. Um, and I, I don't know if any of what I just said is helpful, but it's like, you know, it, if we can support some of these individuals that are communicating regularly with um, with children that are or kids that are like the right age, then we should do more of that. Maybe we should do like maybe, you know, Neact could have their own YouTube channel and they could, you, you know what I mean? Like um, people could do their favorite experiments and uh, and these things catch on. Like my kids really love the gummy bear when you take the chromium and you light them on fire and like, you know, stuff like just really cool experiments uh, really get like, that's what excited me. I don't know. I also okay. made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Thank you. I want to stay, but I need to go. <laughs> I would love to continue talking. Take care. Have a happy summer. And thank you, Dr. McLean. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Liz. I, I think that um, they found that um, teachers make the most impact if they build a bond of trust with their students. And you can do anything else in the world. You can make lists, you can have all these objectives, you can do blah, blah, blah. But if the, you and the kids have a connection, you, you can really make, make things happen. You know, and I think that's obviously, we all believe that because we're sitting here. But, um, you know, if we could, uh, anyway, sometimes kids, it takes a little longer. And that maturity factor certainly comes in because they're just not ready sometimes. Um, but um, 
I don't know. Do we have any other observations or? So that we're out of time. Uh, John, uh, uh, Dr. McLean, I guess the reason why I asked you that question is because, um, you know, this is an area that's very new to, um, you know, to science and, and yet it has these broad implications and you have kids, or people doing research in that area. I assume that at some point during their college education, they begin to learn about different aspects. So they they find they're interested. Do you have seminars that kids uh, attend and, and that kind of thing? Or is it just their their professors are, are in the research area and therefore they kind of do get the information that way? Well, so we have, it depends on the age, right? So yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we also partner with a lot of different groups. And what we do local, and it's all lo and kind of needs to be local a little bit. Mm. Um, so we do things like Geology Day, where um, students will go into a big dirt pit where fossils are, and, oh. that, and that's for like little kids, you know. And we'll have a microbe day, which is where they'll do some microbiology like experiments, and a, a nano day where they do different things. But we also, those are kind of created in those public private kind of partnerships too. Um, we also have in, in our chemistry department here, we have a really strong program called uh, Vanderbilt Students for Science. And these are students that want to become potentially educators as well. And so we have sort of sets of experiments that they will perform and they do, um, they do those experiments like in middle school and high school classrooms. Um, and so we have usually about 200 students that participate in this. So it's kind of a, a larger thing. Um, but a lot of what those experiments do is there is some sort of didactic principle that you're learning in them. But these are the kinds of experiments that are just really kind of cool and engaging, right? So like with the middle school students, usually the last one, the last experiment for that lesson plan will be um, the making ice cream with liquid nitrogen, right? And then, the, you know, and so, <clears throat> so we it depends on the age and it depends on um, sort of the community. It's kind of that meeting them where they are. We used to have a program, I think it might still be running too, called Aspiranon, which was sort of interesting. Um, where students like in some parts of Tennessee and Arkansas would have very long bus rides to get to their, um, to get to their school. And so this was a program where they would have um, almost like in a plane, like on a long flight, they would have little video screens where they could do, they could either watch videos or do uh, play science games and stuff on the way to school, you know, because some of these, these students would have bus rides greater than about uh, 45 minutes, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't sort of touch them sort of in a really formal way, but at least they kind of have resources and things that they could do to kind of engage them in something aside from like watching whatever gaming videos they want you know um yeah i don't know i'd be really curious to hear from others what sorts of things uh really sort of resonate and uh because we're always on the lookout for new things too those are just some of the things that we do Um, I know at Rhode Island College, we, <clears throat> we host a uh, science Olympiad every year um, and kids from all over the state come and they compete in the all a variety of things. Science Olympiad is made up so that <clears throat> it's not just the best students who come. They have to have a variety of kids on their team and they each, uh, sometimes they specialize in a certain area and what they do is they'll 
you know, go to certain competitions. They have different, different related things. Uh, and and it's it's really kind of fun. They get people from all over the state to come and be judges and run different events. And uh, you know, we did the egg drop for many years. Oh my God, what a mess! Anyway, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was fun, and the kids really enjoyed the younger kids especially. Uh, but the whole team enjoys it. They have a science bowl where everybody, you know, the different teams get together and they answer questions with the buzzers and the whole nine yards. So, so there's an activity and then they go to the, they go to the, uh, you know, the uh, annual thing that's national. Uh, they don't always, they, they don't win, but they have fun going to that. So if uh, colleges were to sponsor uh, events that are national type events, that brings out a bunch of kids, especially in the younger grades. They, they love to do that. But um, so we, we've done that. I know in Tennessee, my daughter did this last year in seventh grade. Um, they had like a, and this was, this was a program. I don't know if it's national or not, but I really liked it. It was like, uh, uh, it was called Invention Convention. Okay. And, uh, and Mary's nodding her head. Maybe, maybe you're familiar with this. I thought it was really cool. So the, the students would have to think of a new idea, like invent something. And so my daughter wanted to make um, peelable peanut butter so that you could make a PB&J sandwich faster, right? Because, <laughs> you know, the kids want things faster. And so we talked about like... Um, heat conduction and all these things. And so we took little like containers and put dry ice with water and <clears throat> oil and she could make her frozen peanut butter slices really fast. But what I thought was really cool about it was it, she had to write these little paragraphs about like um, the broader context, like making connections. And so like, you know, why is your invention going to be helpful for a large number of people? And so like, if there's a natural disaster, people need pe peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and they, you know, and so it causes them to think of how they would make, um, how, how to bridge these different ideas and, and thoughts. So I don't know who puts on invention convention, but um, I know that in her seventh grade, um, it does, you know, many of the students did it and really thought it was kind of, kind of fun. That was pretty cool. Do we have any, any other thoughts? Well, I really appreciate meeting everyone and, uh, and I hope the rest of your conference goes really well. This is a really fantastic group. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you speak to us. It was very interesting. Well, that's a really uh, kind, Kathy, but thank you. I, no, I, no, but, you're, but it's so much fun to talk to you. Oh, good. You know. Well, and, I, and, and I've, I've really learned from some of the things that were shared here, too. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to disseminate some of that with some of the people that I work with as well. I already took a screenshot of your um, bacterial culture of the unwashed hand and sent it to my two daughters-in-law and, and the grandsons. <laughs> already got some answers back, like, whoa. <laughs> well, I, you know, what was really cool is over the last year when the students couldn't go into classrooms, right? Um, we still had sort of the, the laboratories, but they were all online where the students would go to middle school. And the one which really freaks me out was um, they'll do an, ex they did it sort of COVID related. When you take hand lotion, it lights up in a black light really well. And maybe you've seen this experiment, but if one student puts hand lotion on and then washes their hands, uh, or shakes the hand of another, you can use a black light and see how well they wash their hands. <clears throat> it just makes me a little OCD now as I, you know. <laughs> And the graphs, will, will we 
be able to access, we will be able to access your slides. I think no? they're recording it. Yes. Um, but if you reach out to me, I'm happy to send you a PDF. Oh, those slides of the, uh, of all the increase in knowledge and internet and number of chemicals identified, uh, it, it blows away what I told my chemist my community college chemistry students just five years ago, just five years ago, the, the numbers. Uh, yeah. well, ed education is such an interesting thing. We need to make critical thinkers because we don't know what they're gonna need to know. For sure. Actually, all the materials for this conference are on the Google Drive. Uh, and that, will, that appears in their clickable program, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So Thank we you. don't we don't need any paper or any worry about that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, if you if we are finished here, I don't see why we can't go and have an early lunch. Um, but um, Donna, do you have any anything to add? Uh, I want to apologize because my daughter was home from England, and you know, I had to make a decision attend the conference or talk with my daughter who stopped in and then had oh. to go. So, you know, I'm really sorry not to be more engaged, but I didn't want to miss out. So she just <laughs> left and here I am and it's the end. No so, apology. Think, no, you made no, the right I'm, decision. You have one, something you want to talk about. Just talk. Uh, well, I'm a high school chemistry teacher. Um, I also teach biology. Um, I will be going back and looking at your materials. Um, you know, and I just listened for a bit about the hand washing. Uh, and I know we've talked about doing a lab where <clears throat> you have the students put their fingers in um, auger and watch the bacteria grow, you know, before washing and after washing. So I'm gonna go back and take a look at what you shared. Um, but I was just wondering, uh, you know, I, high school versus college, um, you know, how many attendees are in each camp? Um, but also, yeah, I was wondering what skill set is lacking when students get to Vanderbilt? What can high school teachers um, work on so that their transition to college is more smooth? That's what I'm, I'm always curious. You know, just the, um, you know, I, I teach in a public school. And sometimes their, their level of writing is just so poor. Um, do you think that we should be focusing more on writing or critical thinking or just everything? Well, my personal vote, Hi, nice to meet you, Betty. Nice to meet you too. Is, Hold on, um, Betty. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my screen shut up. <laughs> I can be a little like a gold. We're here. We're here. <laughs> um, it's still here. So the critical thinking, I think, is key. I think it's sort of the practical experiences that we're finding being most helpful. Math skills are poorer than um, what is going to be really helpful. But here, here's sort of an attitude shift. And I don't, and we didn't talk about this earlier, was, um, well, was sort of related as sort of this fear of failure. And we have these students that will take like uh, AP classes and want to place into higher level classes. And oftentimes we won't allow it. Um, and we won't allow it simply because they're, they're, their fundamental base may be strong, but just if it's slightly shifted from where the next courses are, then, then they may not be as successful in the next class that they take. Mm. Um, there were a lot of challenges with the AP tests this year, um, which I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think like uh, kinetics mm. were covered. And so we had to make a decision whether or not to allow those, and I don't think we are. Um, and so it's it's really sort of the, the critical thinking, making connections, 
And, and I shared with the group that we're also starting some boot camps in the summer to sort of reinforce their mathematics skills. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really how do you, any way that you can do things like flipped classrooms where they're working in teams, um, mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the college courses now, what we're trying to do is move, move in those directions. And so they'll have sort of an experience with that. Sort of that near peer mentorship, I think, is also what we're trying to reinforce a lot. Ooh, good one. Um, so I also wanted to know what you think about NGSS um, with high schools focus, you know, taking a more narrow scope but going deeper. How is that integrating with where they're landing in college? So I'm not sure I'm familiar with NGSS. Okay, so the next generation science standards um, is a new way of teaching and a new way of learning. Um, here in Connecticut, which is where I am, our state has adopted them. And um, they're really um, focusing on creating a phenomenon for each unit and getting the students to come up with observations and questions, and then the teacher uses those questions to help drive instruction. Um, so, and then the instruction is more uh, student-led investigations. Um, so we're using a 5E model where you engage, you let the students explore before you even explain. And then you follow up with, um, extending the concept and, and, and evaluation. Uh, so this is a, a new, these are new standards that have been adopted, I think by 32 states. And a lot of high school teachers feel a bit frustrated. It's very hard to, um, to implement in the classroom. But, you know, our curriculum director is kind of on our case to do it. And there's supposed to be, um, there's, there's benefits. Students are supposed to be more engaged. Uh, so, but we're not covering as much. So I'm wondering when they get to college, you know, the, the students may, may be more self-motivated and engaged, but they're lacking possibly in knowledge. Well, that's an interesting dichotomy, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's kind of that yin and yang, sort of in the critical thinking and things like this, I think it would be great to have those skills, right? And, and, and that's what, what we want them to do. But the students also don't know what they don't know. And so sort of how do we fill in the, and give them exposure to those subject areas? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not gonna pretend that I know what any of those answers are. <laughs> Okay. Um, that, that would be a bit of hubris on my part, but I would rather have, but we're struggling with that at the college level too, because we're kind of moving towards those models, which are what you just described as, as well. Um, we're doing, uh, the American Chemical Society came out with sort of their new guidance about eight years ago, where a lot of and we're still struggling with it, where they wanted us to increase our laboratory hours by 4X about. And wow. so instead of about 50 plus hours, now it's like 400 hours or something. Oh my gosh. And so the, the last year we have a sequence which is called capstone. And so capstone is where really student drive projects for almost the entire year. There is a didactic aspect to it, but it involves, um, it, it's sort of like, okay, so now you know something about chemistry. Now go out and do something with it, right? Um, and those can be really helpful, but from a teaching perspective, they're, they're murder. Yeah. Right? Like you have one faculty member with maybe six students, um, and that's about the, the max that they can can do because almost every single program is tailored. Um, so we're, we're, you know, Donna, we're really struggling with uh, what you're describing too. 
One of the things that we've really been frustrated with is, and different schools have approached this differently. So Kathy, maybe you guys have taken a different approach. We now, we no longer really require two semesters of physical chemistry. Mm. Um, you, no longer, you no longer require? No. Huh. So, so like they typically won't have the second semester of physical, they can use it as an elective if they'd like. Um, but we had to have some built-in flexibility for us to remain certified, at least with ACS. And ACS is only recommending the first semester now. But, you know, so we're missing some of those fundamental skills. And if it keeps moving to different grade levels, like in high school and stuff, then those students will never be exposed to things like uh, fundamental ideas and like uh, thermodynamics or mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. stack neck and stuff like this. Yeah. If I can give some perspective about some of this, um, <clears throat> I, I was involved in a project uh, during the high school when I taught high school, uh, which, which uh, talked about uh, less is more less is more. It is better for students to go into more detail and to be more engaged in, in a fewer, in a sense being, you know, not the lecture method, you know, we're delivering so much information all the time. And, and but how much of that is our delivery and did it get, it, did it get accepted and is it integrated? And so the whole idea is to integrate knowledge into what you know, <clears throat> to build knowledge and to, and to, you know, have it come together. And so, you know, I, I do believe that um, just because we have delivered something doesn't mean that it was internalized. We know that already. Um, and therefore, what you're talking about is um, is that sometimes it's, it's okay to have a little bit, it's okay to reduce the amount that we think we are giving to the kids because they are, it sounds like your, your NGSS is doing more in terms of integrating, making them integrate what they have learned into something where they can, they can retain it and use it. Yes. Okay. Yes. You know, and, and as far as any other thing, I mean, like I said, I, <clears throat> I get a lot of information pinged at me constantly, but I only can integrate so much of it. Um, and if it's meaningful to me, I will find it out. Okay. Sure. So, you know, if a kid asks me a question in class, I'll say, I don't know the answer, but I can go find it. Okay, or if it's something that, you know, so, so if, we, if we get people accustomed to the fact that they know how to root out information when they need it, they know how to, how to get um, that, that type of thing. So I, I do believe less is more is a viable way to go. Yes. Um, you know, in that no, regard. I, yeah, no, I, I think that um, we've only been in this now for three or four years and we really need students who have um, been immersed in this type of teaching to, to come along and to make it really effective. But they call it the 3D approach um, where you are teaching cross cutting concepts yes. such yeah. as um, energy and form and function, yeah. uh, concepts that cut across all disciplines. And then you have science and engineering practices um, like the, the scientific method, but they really actually don't like the scientific method. Um, they rather you make observations and come up with questions and it's, it's similar, but, um, you know, then you have a disciplinary core ideas, um, but they really want you to bring in the science and engineering practices along with the cross cutting concepts because the disciplinary core ideas they can look up, you know, yeah. and so it's more about the process of science, which they can carry forward with them if they're going to become scientists, but they're also skills. They're, they're looking for trans, translational skills. You can translate your knowledge and practices into other areas. You know, it's, so it's more skill-based and not necessarily knowledge-based. I was just well, wondering, you know, with, with less, what, what are you expecting on the college end? 
you know, who's looking at that transition from high school to college? How is it working out on your end? I was just kind of curious, you know, it's, you know, you, you may not know, but it's just something I've been wondering about. Well, Kathy, what, what are you saying? Well, I, you know, again, I don't, supposedly people have been using standards and using various things where it doesn't so much depend on the, the knowledge, but the skill. And I don't see a lot of it coming to me. Um, there are, I don't get the best students. We were a working class community. Um, and I feel it's up to us to, to help them integrate new ideas into what they already know. And I, I treat them like high school students when I, they're, they're freshmen, they are high school. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, over the years, it feels like um, kids have become to, come to college a little less prepared every year. I used to have freshmen in high school that knew more than some of the people I think are seniors. Um, I don't know why. Um, maybe there was a more serious bent in terms of valuing and a good education and valuing uh, getting to a certain place in your life. Now, that's why I say I, I don't know if these new methods make any difference, but um, yeah. I do know if you try something new, <clears throat> you have to get people, give people a chance to become acclimated to that way of learning. Otherwise, um, it won't work. So you need at least three years and maybe more for there to be some kind of internalization of that process, you know? Yeah. So I don't know, that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, well, and then they're learning by doing, but then when you have students who are absent for wow. a few classes, um, I feel incredible stress to bring them up to speed myself. So that's something that I have to iron out before this school year what starts. What about working with, a group, with groups in, our, in terms of uh, some of the people at our college are working <clears throat> with the reverse, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they're reversing the tables so that they work with groups and she does input and she does various other things and they have lab and yet they, they get together and they work on assignments and they um, you know try to explain to each other and then they have the teacher as well. And that seems to work for some people and others, they're not ready for it, you know. Right. That's the way we, you know, how do we learn? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've got a situation where I, I don't know something, so I have to go figure it out. So maybe I talk to some people that I, that know about it, you know, usually I do some reading about it. I try to make sense out of it myself. And so that, that's basically what we're trying to prepare people for is a future of, of being interested and curious and knowing how to find the next thing, how to be resourceful. You know, um, and some people are amazingly resourceful, some kids, but when it comes to academics, they fall on their sword. Why? You know, it's the same thing. It's, it's like, this is, lit, you know, so anyway, sorry, it gets started. No, 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 it's a daily struggle. I get crazy. You know, <laughs> one of the things, one of the things is internal motivation. And, you know, now yes, absolutely. Re brain based research is saying, especially with male students, that they're not even there until their 20s. And I'll bet, I'll bet Dr. McLean's wife knows as a forensic psychologist that, that some of the incarcerated people uh, did some really dumb, dumb things to get themselves in, incarcerated. So we don't know what kind of motivation these kids have other than you have to go to college and you have to succeed and you have to be this and and some parents of this generation treat their kids like it's their brand spanking new bmw or something as to where they're i saw it i saw it with my with my daughter-in-law not blabbing things about where daniel had been accepted to college and other parents were just you know Yay, he got into this school on all over Facebook, like it's some kind of reward. I found that some of my best students, seriously, were evening students at community college because there were so many adult learners. Uh, uh. And they were enormously motivated. There were some high school students there too. And they were the ones who already, they just couldn't even fit AP chemistry into their high school curriculum. They were taking so many courses. So they were there taking chemistry at night 
or, um, or students who realized at age 24, oh, I'm working and I'm working as hard and know as much as this registered nurse next to me. And I have to get my, my butt in gear because I'm getting no pay and she's getting really good pay. And I need to take chemistry so that I can get a, a nursing degree. Or the adult male who lost his job in 2008 and had to retrain or on and on, or someone who delayed their career and put their kids through school and now wanted to. So they were, or someone who worked for Electric Boat and had where Kathy, your husband, the engineer worked forever and said, oh, oh, I can get um, a pay raise if I only take such and mm -hmm. such and such and mm -hmm. such because I'll be trained for. They were motivated. I mean, absolutely mm -hmm. motivated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I loved teaching community college at night, mm -hmm. not in the morning because I had what some of your other descriptors were where they're, they're walking in at eight o'clock in the morning with the Dunkin' Donuts coffee and what time is it? And looking, and looking at their phone, you know? You know? Um, but, but that's, it's tough. I, high, school, high school teaching is, oof, I think it's brutally tough. I loved it and did it for decades, but, um, but, but the challenges today are enormous. Yeah. And Donna, you're asking Dr. McLean, what did, you know, you can only do the best you can with the group you have at mm -hmm. the time you have them mm -hmm. under the constraints in which you have them. And certain things we just can't overcome just ourselves. We can't overcome grinding poverty at, at home or the student who's absent because they have to go take care of younger kids because mom has to go a you know, mom has to go appear in court for, for something. Mm -hmm. um, it's with, yeah. With kids being remote, a lot of them were home taking care of younger siblings. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was just, you know, when so they came up with these next generation science standards and I was just wondering, well, has anyone communicated this to the college professors? You know, how are things going to change? I'm glad we had this this conversation because I'm time will tell we're not just, there re just remember you're doing good work okay and we okay. measure ourselves by the failures uh, as teachers we should measure ourselves by you don't know what kind of, of uh, you really don't know what kind of influence you have had on your kids and someday they're going to come back to you and they're going to say I remember blah 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 whatever it is and you're going to say wow I didn't even think that kid was watching, you know? Yeah. And we're yeah. so hard on ourselves. Nobody's perfect. Anyway, I want to thank everyone for being here, especially Dr. McLean for staying with us. It was a wonderful conversation. And, um, you know, hopefully our paths will meet again. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. Like I said, like this has been the highlight of the past few months. And just being able to meet with you and people that are really kind of on the front lines, you know, go science. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and Mary, you're absolutely right. Um, and about frontal lobe development until like mid twenties. <laughs> and my, my kids, of course, are always really uh, frustrated with all my dad jokes and stuff. So my maturity level, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> Someday I hope so. But I hope all of you have a really lovely uh, rest of your conference and a really lovely afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Yes. I'll see you all. Our next session begins at 1.30, I believe. Oh, wait a minute. There's one session. At, there's something at 1.30. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, Kathy. Oh, she, she went. Okay. I'm going to call her. All right.